As Starship testing goes into overdrive, milestones to the first orbital attempt are revealed. NASA bestows the spacecraft with another mission, Falcon Heavy steals the spotlight from Falcon 9, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. SpaceX kicked off a jam-packed week of testing their Mars rocket as thoughts of, hey, this is really happening, get super therial. SpaceX cryoloaded a super heavy booster on Monday and conducted another Starship quick disconnect retraction in real time. The following day, partially filling Starship 25's liquid oxygen and methane tanks with what I expect is liquid nitrogen as it rests on suborbital pad A. Then on Wednesday, repeating and pressing further, appearing to slowly top off the lower LOX tank and maybe a bit of the upper CH4 tank. On the fourth weekday, it was back to the fully stacked 24-7 vehicle, once again pumping cryo into both vessels' methane tanks. Big Girl is expected to attempt the first orbital flight possibly as soon as early next month. According to NASA's own Deputy Associate Administrator for Artemis Campaign Development, Mark Kiersich speaking on the agency's Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Committee. Reiterating that the plan still stands for SpaceX to launch from Starbase Texas and splash down the upper stage near Hawaii, but informing us that he does not believe SpaceX will attempt a tower catch of the first stage, which Elon once said was only a possibility. Before this highly anticipated event can lift off, a few remaining objectives were listed out on a PowerPoint during NASA's webcast. It's still expected 24-7 will be de-stacked so the super heavy booster can conduct a 33-engine static fire, then restacked once again so the entire vehicle can undergo a full wet dress rehearsal, loading both parts with liquid oxygen and methane and executing a countdown for practice. Also, some clarity on the FAA's environmental licensing was given. Although SpaceX was granted approval back on June 13th to launch the full stack from Boca Chica via a mitigated finding of no significant impact, there were conditional strings attached. Hopefully, SpaceX is just about finished taking care of the more than 75 issues that were listed by the FAA to lessen the company's impact on the local area. Mark also said, besides the first orbital launch, NASA is tracking three additional major Starship flights. One to test propellant transfer in space so HLS can be refueled, which is very high on NASA's top risk list. One unspecified longer duration Starship mission. And the fourth being the uncrewed lunar landing demo currently slated for late 2024. Then of course the first crewed HLS mission to land on the moon, Artemis 3, will follow. And now Artemis 4, using both the Lunar Space Station Gateway and HLS, is expected to host passengers according to Mark, even though it was previously deemed too much complexity too soon. Starship missions, these included, will require tons of engines, even though Starship Super Heavy rockets are designed to be fully reused, because it will take thousands of ships to colonize the Red Planet, which is the ultimate goal. And each rocket currently requires a total of 39 Raptor 2s. So to fulfill the rocket's purpose of colonizing Mars, Elon's latest estimate is that eventually roughly 1,000 Raptors per year will need to be manufactured. According to Ars Technica, Mark stated that SpaceX has moved very quickly on Raptor development and that the company reached their near-term goal to build one a day last quarter. But speaking of the Starship fleet, let's go back to Starbase for a moment. Brennan Lewis is still using his artistry skills to provide visual progress checks. You can find him on Elon's new company called Twitter. The biggest thing to notice is that B9 became the third fully stacked booster in the current lineup last week. So keep those engines coming. And by the way, congrats MVAC team on your 200th engine. So with that, let's talk about Falcon. On Monday night, SpaceX's fourth Falcon Heavy rocket, first in three years, went vertical on pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, Florida, and launched the following morning at 9.41 a.m. Eastern, carrying a classified payload for the United States Space Force. Virtual high fives all around to those of you who were my viewing buddies for this rad-tastic mission. Despite the ripe for the licking ground clouds, or fog as normies call it, SpaceX provided some tubular action shots, bruh. Hang 10. The twin side boosters were jettisoned successfully, both performed boost back burns to return to the coast and land at LZ-1 and 2. Behold, the sorcery of rocket science, you muggles. The center core booster wasn't equipped with landing legs and was expended because the vehicle needed to use the extra fuel so Falcon could deploy the payload to geosynchronous Earth orbit. A couple days later, early Thursday morning, Falcon 9 lifted off from two pads down at Slick 40, carrying another payload for UTELSAT, or UTELSAT. UTELSAT is a world-leading satellite operator covering Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and the Americas. 
This was the seventh launch and landing of this booster, touching down on just read the instructions, bobbing on the Atlantic about eight and a half minutes after liftoff. The Hotbird 13G satellite was successfully deployed to geosynchronous transfer orbit about a half hour later. If you go to Starlink.com, you'll notice SpaceX has added a new page to the website for Swarm Satellite Internet of Things. SpaceX acquired Swarm last year, which specializes in building small sats, and is now offering customers with compatible devices IOT service, which is basically like Starlink, but for people in remote areas with the need to only transmit little data. So probably not you. Really quick, most of you know I usually only do one plug for my Patriot supply per month, but you know, since we're heading into a cold, dark winter with dire energy shortages, including diesel reserves that are at a 71 year low and prices are expected to increase, I don't have to tell you what happens to the supply chain if the ships and trucks stop coming. Also food shortages. I mean, I guess you just could obey the psychopaths that want you to eat bugs. Best get digging before the snow sets in. But we're also dealing with war in the East, possibly global war with the side of China and all the economic turmoil that comes with that. So please check out preparewithspace.com and purchase some emergency food for you and your loved ones that last up to 25 years. They do ship to Canada, but I'm sorry, Europe, you're SOL. Good luck. My Patriot Supply brought back the best deal they've had since pre-pandemic. You can save $250 off a three-month kit that contains a wide variety of meals while the offer lasts. So now is the time to order before it's too late. Invest in a little peace of mind at preparewithspace.com. And now it's time for today's honorable mention. The lunar rover that has been featured in SpaceX renders of HLS on the surface of the moon is a step closer to becoming tangible. Yesterday, NASA announced that a draft request for proposals for the LTV service contract, that's Lunar Terrain Vehicle, is now ready for industry review, and NASA will accept feedback until the 1st of December. It outlines the agency's expectations for use of the LTV on the lunar surface as early as 2028. After taking industry feedback into account, NASA writes it plans to issue a final request for proposals by early 2023. Of course, it won't be the first golf cart to transport astronauts from hole to hole on the natural satellite. Apollo's last three missions, 15, 16, and 17, utilized three moon buggies called Lunar Roving Vehicles, or LRVs, that were folded up like GIMP transformers and deployed from the Lunar Module's Quadrant 1 bay. An excellent documentary series called Moon Machines did an episode of the LRVs, and I watched all the episodes, including that one, at least 20 times. Happy hunting. But quickly, while we're on the topic of the moon, NASA astronaut Don Petitis shared a picture of his pretty dope Halloween costume, an Artemis surface spacesuit prototype test frame known as XEMU, used to evaluate the HUD that will show surface maps, locations, and systems perimeters while on lunar excursions. Well, that's all, folks. Thanks for stopping by and sharing this moment with me. I like moments. Shout out to other moment lovers who join the Space Eccentric Locals page to support the channel and keep the moments coming. Do have a nominal weekend, and until our next moment, Godspeed.